Oh, do I need it? Can I use this? Yeah, you can use that. But you have to talk into it. So okay, is that okay? Yeah. Well, thank you, and, and it's great to be here. Um, actually, I wasn't in Europe, I was in Africa, but I was coming here anyway. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, I, I, we had a conference on sustainable forest management in Central Africa, in Cameroon, um, uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. So that's. I landed at lunch, so I was a little handicapped because I haven't seen the previous presentations, but I managed to flip through some of them, so I've got a little bit of a picture of what you talked about. Um, so just to explain a little bit more where I come from, um, I studied in Sweden. I went a uh, Jägmästare from uh, SLU. I got my PhD from SLU as well, and then I worked as, as uh, Crystal said, uh, 14 years at FAO, first with forestry and then as director of climate change, energy and land tenure. And then uh, about eight months ago, I moved to Indonesia and took up my new job as director general of uh, the Center for International Forestry Research. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so uh, I didn't get to choose the title of this presentation, so I'll start by complaining about the title. <laughs> I've heard feeding the world so many times that I'm, I'm very, very tired about that expression. If I meet a farmer, I don't say, thank you for feeding me. It's not about spoon feeding people. It's, we're creating an image here that agriculture is about some kind of safeguard for the world's population and, and we have to take care of everybody. I don't think that's the right picture. And then while holding the carbon in forests and soils, come back to that more later, but of course, yes, that's one objective among many, many other objectives. So let's, let's see where this, this ends up. Um, am I using the keyboard here or this one? That works. Okay, so I want to start to talk about the question, is there a problem? And if there is a problem, what is it? Secondly, zooming out quite a bit from the discussion and, and uh, see what are the actual priorities and talk about the sustainable development agenda as it is currently projected. Then I come back a little bit to issues that we're talking about. We spend a lot of time on land. We spend much less on labor and capital for some reason. And where are the limiting factors actually? A few words on the role of science and then some conclusions. But first of all, I want to explain where I am now. This is the headquarter of C4. It's located in Bogor, which is outside Jakarta in Indonesia. And um, that's our headquarters, and we are active across the tropics, as you can see on the map below. And C4 is an intergovernmental organization. The focus is on research, and our um, vision is that decisions that influence forests and the landscape and the people, to, uh, and people related to that is supported by solid science and principles of good governance. Now, a little bit more about C4. It's an intergovernmental organization. It was born after the first Rio conference, or as we all know, Stop 1 Plus 20, as it is normally known. Uh, and uh, one of the founding members was actually Sweden. And that's uh, quite a good thing to remember. And uh, at this time, it's noteworthy to say that our sister uh, organization, the World Agroforestry Center, was headed by Björn, who sits at the front here, when C4 was founded. Um, and then Indonesia bid successfully to have its headquarters, and today, we, this year, we celebrate our 20-year anniversary. It's important to recognize that C4 is not alone. We are part of a consortium of 15 international research organizations, and they cover the whole spectrum of agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. There is a rice institute in the Philippines, there is an agroforestry in Kenya, a livestock also in Kenya. There is a potato institute in Peru, etc. Food policy in Washington, D.C. So we're part of this consortium, and altogether we actually turn over almost a billion dollars in research every year. Our role is, of course, to lead the work on forests and forestry, but we also contribute quite a lot, contribute quite a lot to the research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. So there's a lot of connections here, and I think the integration of these topics is one of the, my key points today. Now, is there a problem? And if so, what is it? I was born early 60s, and in this time period, some remarkable things have happened. First of all, food got much cheaper. 
there are a lot of talk these days that food prices are rise, rising, and they are over the past five, seven years or so, maybe ten years. But the long-term trend is actually that food has become cheaper. At the same time, of course, our emissions of greenhouse gases has tripled. And at the same time, our GDP per capita worldwide has tripled. And at the same time, our food production has tripled. And at the same time, the number of not food insecure people has tripled. These are all big trends that we've seen over the past 50 years. But the interesting thing is that over this time period, the number of food insecure people has been constant. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us a number of things. It tells us that food production does not seem to be very correlated with food security. Maybe locally, maybe in certain circumstances, but that in the big picture, not really. It also tells us that GDP per capita is not related to food security. Of course it is locally, and of course it is for poor people, but generally speaking, we've become a much richer world and we haven't reduced the number of food insecure people. That's quite remarkable. And, and of course it tells us that we spend a much, much lower proportion of our income on food these days than we did 50 years ago. I think it's important to have this time spectrum uh, at the back of our head when we discuss today's problems as we, as we see them. So some observations here is that food security is only partly related to food production. And climate change mitigation in the land-based sectors, agriculture, forestry, and I would like to include fisheries, is only partly related to storing more carbon or keeping more carbon. I think there were several presentations that brought that up already. So which, this means that the title of this presentation is only considering parts of food security and, and climate change mitigation objectives. I don't know how big part, maybe not so big at all. Because food security is much more related to poverty, to social protection systems, to the functions of markets and distributions, and to awareness and knowledge sharing. A very big part of food insecurity today is, is obesity and, and poor nutrition, and we need to bear that in mind as well. Um, so feeding the world is about much more than growing food, is the point I'm making. And of course, other significant parts of climate change mitigation on land is resource use efficiency. We heard a lot about that already. And something that I'm not sure was mentioned, the waste and losses, which of course provides an enormous potential for climate change mitigation. I mean, we, we, can, we can reduce on the margin the amount of emissions we produce for a kilo of carbon, but if we throw half of it away anyway, it's kind of uh, not really uh, a good solution. So, moving from there, getting the priorities right. And here I would like to zoom out and talk about what defines our priorities. And this slide is a little bit towards the political end of the spectrum. I will come back to the more finance, private sector, end of the spectrum a bit later. But from a political side at the international level, I think these are the, the, the big ones. The post-2015 development agenda, which started with the Rio Plus 20. We're talking about sustainable development goals and, of course, a lot about poverty reduction. Food security is very high on the, on the international agenda, uh, has been for a very long time. There's an increasing focus on nutrition and health. And there is an increasing focus on the long-term aspects of food security, climate, smart agriculture, and food systems at large. There is, of course, a huge focus on handling climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, and a big part of this is the rural communities and the land-based sectors. Biodiversity remains politically a very strong issue. Maybe not in, in practice, but politically. And then finally, something I want to highlight, because I think one of the major, to me, one of the better outcomes of the Rio Plus 20 meeting was a focus on the green economy, green growth, and green growth with equity, as the leadership in Indonesia calls it. Um, and I think this, this kind of provides the last piece of, of this puzzle in the sense that we're not only talking about 
problems and how we solve them. We're also talking about how can we get the return on investments in a green economy. And that's a much more positive way of looking at it. So, at this is, called, is covered by equity. Uh, so, in a way, just to make this a little bit more catchy, we can talk about the big five. You probably know the big five in terms of wildlife. I call this the big five of sustainable development. And immediately some will complain that their issue is not here. For example, the certification convention is not here. And actually, they don't, in my view, uh, make the top five lists. But that can be discussed. Anyway, so we have these five. I want to repeat them again. And in some way, we need to figure out how does forestry and agriculture relate to these? There's a, there's a history here of, particularly in the forestry field, but I think also in the agriculture field, that we isolate the sector, we figure out our own goals, we have our own small international processes, and we sit there and huddle around our issues internally. And the result of that is pretty much that we, in the end, are not considered by the mainstream, the big five processes, at least not in the way that we would like to. Um, and the way forward, I think, is that we must open up the sectors and think directly about the big five sustainable development objectives. Things we're covering today are part of it, clearly. But I think we need to have a much more mainstream approach to, to these bigger um, development goals. And only in that way will our, if you like, sectors have political relevance. Only in this way we can define positive contributions, because this is another big issue. I saw that it was part of somebody else's presentation today. If you talk, talk about forestry internationally, it's always a problem. It's never a positive contribution. It's always about deforestation or illegal logging or um, uh, other issues that, that, are, that are related to, to problems in, in, the, in, the, in the bigger uh, processes. If you go to the Climate Change Convention and you talk about um, the red, guessing everybody's familiar with the red agenda here, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the agenda there has been very, very strong, strongly against the forest sector and very much for forest conservation. That's not, forest conservation is not bad, but it's not the full picture. Similarly, a similar discussion is there in the Biodiversity Convention. Again, of, of course, conservation is the, is the big thing, and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But the forest sector and the agriculture sector are not really present. And in the forestry case, my, one of my hypotheses is that this all started with the Millennium Development Goals. And if you remember, these were instituted around the year 2000. They weren't actually politically accepted until much later, but they started in the year 2000. There were eight goals defined. One of them was about the environment, and that's where they tucked in forestry. The only indicator on forestry is the forest area. I, by chance, I was responsible for reporting that particular figure to, to the UN Statistics Office. So I was part of these meetings where the, we debated the indicators and we should be in and we should be out. But the point here is that this is the only thing that has been visible in the international processes about forestry. A, it's about the environment, and B, it's only about the area. That's it. So since then, every time you hear about forestry, in the international processes, it's about the environment and nothing more. So that's coming back to this slide. This is why it is so tremendously important to start talking about the forests and agriculture sectors in relation to all of these development objectives. Because I think there are, and we know, there are many contributions to, to be made across this spectrum. So taking another look at this, these five the big five are actually also five silos. And it's amazing when you travel around to these big meetings how well isolated they are from each other. And often actively so. The Rio Plus 20 process actively avoided climate change because climate change was supposed to be handled by the Climate Change Convention. 
etc. So what happens then is that each of these silos create their own solution to things that in turn relate to the land-based sectors. So we get a tremendous fragmentation of the agenda. And you see in the middle there somewhere the red piece. Um, and you, you can also see some other things that the climate change process has not yet defined what it wants to do with agriculture. Um, the Rio Plus 20 is still to be determined. The biodiversity has separate work programs for agriculture, forestry and, and marine environments, um, etc. So we, we, we're, it's not very helpful but, um, if you want to create a bigger picture solution. So what do we do about that? We are, we are working with partners, particularly in the CDIR, um, and thinking about how do we break down the silos between the sectors and how do we then create a way to approach these bigger development goals uh, together. Meeting the climate change mitigation issues and meeting the need for food production, but also meeting all the other ones. And we think that a sustainable landscape framework is the way to go. At the moment, we are debating how do we define the objectives of such a landscape. And we, we think that we can define a landscape saying that it should produce four things. It should produce livelihood provisions, meaning you must be able to make money, in short. It needs to sustain ecosystem services. We've heard a lot about that. That includes the carbon, of course. It needs to deliver food and non-food products at a reasonable level and it needs to have resource efficiency and low levels of pollution. So just a way of generically describe what we can define as a landscape. And of course, this landscape is a huge part of the bigger sustainable development equation. If we can find a way to analyze landscapes as a whole and how they contribute to all the goals, then we can kind of cut out a big chunk of that sustainable development equation. There, we need combined solutions for this. We can't find out what do we do in forestry and what do we do in agriculture. Um, there will always be a need for combined solutions. And one interesting thing that happens when we started to discuss this, it all started actually around the climate change convention. Um, for the last six convention COPs, there's one every year, the last six, there's been something called a forest day. And it was actually organized by C4. It started, of course, way before I, I joined. It's organized by C4 with many other partners. And, of course, a big part of the technical discussion on red and other forest issues happened in this site meeting. At the same time, there was also an agriculture day run by the, the what I mentioned before, the CDIR program on climate change, agriculture and food security together with many other partners in the agriculture sector. Also a very good side event. Many of the agriculture issues were de debated there, but they were two separate meetings. So last year we decided that let's join them and have a landscape forum. And that triggered some interesting reactions. Forestry institutions said, well, we can't do that because our issues will disappear. We will not be visible. And interestingly, the agriculture institution said, oh, we can't do that because our issues will not be visible. Uh, that was quite interesting. And therefore, we've discussed this quite a lot over the past six months. And the conclusion is that it's actually the exact opposite. This is the only way we can make sure that the role of the sectors are strengthened. Well, not, maybe not the only way, but it's a way to strengthen the role of the sectors to make the sectors be relevant to the development goals. Because if we continue on our isolated tracks, it won't be. We will be very comfortable in our existing institutions, but isolated. Um, another, I want to dwell on that. Um, I won't dwell on that, but I won't dwell on that. We can come back to that in the discussion, maybe. So in November, we're having the first global landscape forum. It will be very interesting to see where this is then going. One of the ideas we have in uh, the climate change context is that 
we can't continue, if you remember my matrix with fragmented solutions, we can't continue to discuss red agriculture and land use change in separate fora. We need, we need somehow to bring them together. And we have quite good support for this approach. Now, land, labor, and capital. And I mentioned earlier that we always have a strong focus on land. We hear about hectares here and there. We hear about how to manage the land in different ways. But very seldom do we go into the other production factors. And this is, of course, classical economic theory that I'm not an expert in, but I think I can say something about it. For, first, an anecdote on labor. I was in, in Western Kenya um, a couple of years ago, and we were traveling in a uh, mixed forest and agroforestry area on Mount Elgon. And I was there as a climate change person from FAO and traveling with some NGOs. And the whole trip from uh, Kisumu, they talked about how bad eucalyptus were. Introduced species, really, really bad. Um, in my view, some valid points, of course. The, the water issue can be problematic in some places. and the, Having exotic species is always tricky, but you know it was, it was very much an ideological position. So we traveled and we came to this farmer, um, and uh, interestingly, he had planted eucalyptus over more than half of his farm. So I thought this was interesting, and so we started talking to the farmer, and and, uh, and he explained his choices, and he said that well, my kids are, have moved to Nairobi. And I'm I'm 60 years old. I don't have the labor to do anything else. So for him, labor was the limiting factor. Growing eucalyptus was the smartest thing he could do with the resources that he had. He had the land, he probably had the capital too, but he didn't have the labor. So that determined his choice. And yesterday, I was, it sounds a little bit pretentious, but actually yesterday I had lunch with the Minister of Agriculture in Cameroon, and we talked about similar things. And she said, yeah, the young people are moving to the cities, they're looking for other things to do, they don't want to farm, so there's not, the labor is becoming a problem at the farms. So, you know, maybe the problem in agriculture is not production or climate change or other things, maybe it's labor. And maybe we need more mechanization in some places that, where we don't have it. Just, I'm not arguing for it, I'm just throwing it out there. Okay, so capital. Uh, another, another. I said I was coming back to the private sector uh, a little bit. And uh, another area we are working in is, again, together with agriculture partners and with partners from the investment sector. And we are looking at what would it take to scale up investments in sustainable landscapes for green returns. This is the green economy side of it. And we started this by coming from, again, the climate change agenda and, again, the red agenda. And many have seen red as an opportunity for private investments to come in and kind of take over the business that the private sector would drive the purchasing of carbon credits and there would be a carbon market that would transform all this to good things. Um, Aside of the fact that the carbon market doesn't really exist yet, or at least struggles a lot, aside of that, when you talk to investment people, they ask you, so what was that investment proposition you talked about again? They don't understand it. They can't see it. It's not tangible. It's not, it's not something that they, it's so full of risks and uncertainties that it's really not an option for them. So that led us to, to, to think a little bit about this. Okay, so how can, we, how can we convert this into a real option for investments? Um, and thinking not about the agribusiness companies coming in and, and uh, buying land, but thinking about creating a credit system where farmers could borrow money at reasonable rates at, over longer term and perhaps invest in, in their businesses. And so we worked a little bit along these lines, and some things that would be needed to make this work is first to understand the basic objectives in, in these landscapes and, and what, what, are, what are 
what are the investments for? That's quite important. And also how to measure progress at reasonable cost. Uh, of course, we need to understand the return opportunities. And, and here it's, it doesn't really matter who you talk to. There was a, somebody from Denmark who works in uh, investments in sustainable forestry all over the planet. Uh, he was at the, at the conference in Cameroon too. And he confirmed again what you hear many times that the profitability of investments is not the problem. If you can invest in land use and you can make money out of it, the problem is not there. The problem is in all the overhead and the transaction costs and the uncertainties that you meet along the way. But we need to understand this better. Of course, we need a commitment from the public sector to make it all work. Um, we need to accept that it's the farmers that are in charge. It is their choices and priorities and aspirations that will in the end determine what will be done and if we go towards sustainable landscapes or not. And then we need to figure out a solution that makes large-scale investors, and now we're talking pension funds and maybe not even billions but trillions, to make them happy. And at the same time make the small-scale producers happy, taking all of the above into account. It's kind of a big equation to solve, but we thought it was interesting, so we've been working on it. And at the investor level, there is money. I mean, we're talking about people who are choosing between putting them in Italian government bonds or putting them somewhere else. And they are looking for somewhere else. And farmers, of course, perceive that a big limiting factor is access to capital. I think that might even be true in, 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 uh, um, in richer countries. And the public sector obviously wants to steer the investments towards sustainable development. So it seems that, yeah, the, the possibility is there. But then we have the thing with the returns and the risks. And this is just to illustrate um, where the investment people want to take this. And the big part of the risk is putting all the eggs in one basket, whether that basket is particular crop or a particular country or a particular currency or a particular climate region. But if you mix everything, uh, you can actually create a totally uncorrelated set of risks. And that's something the investment people like, I've learned. Um, then they can, if you, if you can eliminate all risks on a, on a statistical way, then they can make money. It's strange, but that's how it works. Um, so from the investment side, they seem to have a way to do it. So what remains to be done, and that's more on our side of, of, the, of the game, is that we need to have an affordable verification of those sustainability outcomes that we're after. And here I come back to that landscape framework. And what we need is a very simple way to describe what we want. It has to be simple because it has to be affordable. It has to be simple because the investors need to know what they're buying. And it still has to be sophisticated enough to express where we want to go uh, in terms of sustainable development. And maybe these four are enough. We'll see. We're working on it. Okay. What's the time? How am I doing on time? Okay, that's good. Um, so now I'll jump to something completely different. Um, we are a research organization. We work mainly with research partners. And we are concerned with the link between science and policy. And to get there, we are investing more and more in what we call evidence-based policies. Specifically, we're working with evidence-based forestry, but this is not a forestry meeting, so I should say, put it more broadly. And the point there is that, first of all, evidence-based policies is a big thing. It has existed for decades. Other sectors are using it regularly. The medic medical sector, for example, is basing pretty much a very large proportion of their policy advice on evidence-based um, processes. Similarly, investment of public funds in, for example, the UK and other sectors go through evidence-based policy processes. And gradually, we're, this is now, these methods and, and uh, um, th these methods are moving over also to the natural resources side, and this is good. However, there are some misconceptions that we need to deal with. One is that science does not provide the solutions. Sometimes politicians seem to hide behind science because that's 
the scientists told us this was good, so that's our decision. Of course, that's not the case. But without science, good solutions will not be found. So we're always talking about the combination of science, expert opinion, and society's need and preferences. We're not talking only about science when we talk about the evidence-based policies. But the important thing here is that very, very often we end up here, outside the best science, with a lot of expert opinions. You can take almost any debate we have in the forestry field. You can take biofuels. It's all opinions. We had a big conference in FAO some six years ago, uh, heads of state and all the rest of it. And before that, we had studies on this was at the same time as the food prices went up. And everybody, some thought it was because of biofuels and some thought not. So we had a lot of background studies done. And depending on your political preference, the influence on the food prices of biofuels ranged from about 3% to about 75%. Pick and choose. You can always find the study that supports your opinion. So that's, that's the uh, danger here. Um, I won't spend more time on this, I'm just saying that it's, it's an area we're investing in and a lot of the things I've talked about so far will require that we do a much more, have a much more systematic approach to reviewing science and that there is more at stake here than, than one might think. Some, some of our staff are involved in the IPCC work, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They are now I think it's out for government's review at the moment. They're now finalizing the new manual for greenhouse gas uh, estimations. And some of my staff were involved in the chapter that deals with emissions from peatlands, which is, as you know, a big thing. And it turns out that some of the members of the team for that report cheat. Uh, we don't really know why. Maybe they wanted their results to be more visible. Maybe there were more money in the consulting of reducing emissions if the emissions were upped uh, compared to what the science said. But the point was that the process did not appropriately take science into account systematically. And IPCC being a fairly closed and political process, it's very difficult to do something about it. So, there are things to improve there. No more issues. Some take home messages. Food security is not only partly about agriculture. Land based climate change mitigation is only partly about storing carbon. Sustainable landscape can be part of a new development narrative. And our plans for the future must be evidence based. And last slide, coming back to the title of this presentation can we both feed all and store carbon? I would say yes provided that we support innovation and investment, provided we develop, I call it planning tools, as a bit loose, bit of a loose concept, for handling of multiple objectives. We're not very good at that. We are very good at providing tools for single objectives, but not for multiple objectives. Uh, we entrust science, and we, as I said, make appropriate use of those, those results, and that we spend public funds wisely as per above. I'm not terribly worried if you remember the 50-year development curve, we can do this. It's not a matter of, you know, planet being completely devastated by our population growth and, and so on. So I think we can do this. But again, remember the food production and carbon stories are only part of the picture. There are many other issues out there. Thank you.